Hey everybody, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and I am in, of all places, Lenox, South Dakota. I've never been here. I don't know anything about this town other than it has a cool name, and apparently it has a cool church. I say apparently because I don't know the gentleman who runs this church, but I got a tip from a mutual friend that this was the gentleman to talk to about the Presbyterian tradition, the Presbyterian Church of America in this case. His name is Ethan. I don't even actually know his last name. I am literally about to meet him for the first time ever and ask him questions about Presbyterianism, his specific Presbyterian denomination, and this particular church, which is called Lennox Ebenezer Presbyterian Church. What's an Ebenezer? I got to ask this guy. Ethan, I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Matt. I know this is a weird question to lead with, but I'm not sure I know what an Ebenezer is, and it's right there in your name. Right. So it's got to be a big deal to you guys. Right. What's an Ebenezer? Ebenezer is from the Old Testament in the book of Samuel. They erect a large pillar of stones, and whenever they saw that pillar of stones, they would say, this pillar of stones is here to remind us of how God delivered us. And the, uh, the Hebrew word for that is Ebenezer, which means stone of help. So Ebenezer's in, in our name, and just as a reminder, that we're here to remind one another of all that God's done to, to save us. Is it all right if we head inside and I just pick Absolutely. your brain about the Come whole thing? Yep. Cool, thank you. What is Presbyterian? Methodists are called Methodists because they had a, a method of attaining to righteousness. Lutherans are called Lutherans because they follow the teachings of Martin Luther. Presbyterians are called Presbyterians because we have a Presbyterian government. So you're not named after somebody you like, like Dick or Roger Presbyter. Right. So polity is very polity important. Polity is a big, a big part of, of who we are. It's how we govern ourselves and how we, we, uh, we play nice together. Um, and so Presbyterian being uh, uh, a government of elders who are elected from among the congregation in order to shepherd and guide uh, the con th that congregation. Plus, the, the elders then come together and form presbyteries. So you have many churches that, uh, within a region that come together, and the elders represent uh, that body as a whole. And then presbyters go to our General Assembly, which is the national uh, govern governing body, and make decisions that then have to be ratified by the local presbyteries. Come on in. Oh, this is neat. Simple, I think, is the thing that we try to um, emphasize, especially in a lot of Reformed services or Reformed worship places, right. sanctuaries. And there's not a lot of decor because we, we just want to have our hearts and minds directed toward God. Very much Reformation values right there. Right. What would you guess this reminds me of as I walk in? An ark. Is the ark thing on purpose? I believe in, there was a lot of intention in that when God called Noah into the ark, and in the ark was the place where salvation was, and the church is taught that normally there's no salvation outside of the church. That if you want to know where to come and hear the gospel, where to come and, and, and find grace, where to come and be part of a community of faith, it's within the ark, it's within that, 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 that body that God has redeemed. And so, yeah, there's, this, there's a sense in which we want to uh, recreate that, that idea, make us think along those lines. But there's also a sense in which those, those beams draw your eyes upward. And you know, so when, when, we're, when we're standing in praise and when we're coming in in prayer, you know, so our eyes, our hearts, our minds are, are lifted up. And so there's, there should be some design, some aesthetic in the architecture that does that. First thing that you're probably gonna be drawn to is some of the stained glass. Yeah. Um, and over on this side, the stained glass are vignettes from Old Testament story. You have the story of creation, Adam and Eve and the fall, Cain and Abel with their sacrifice, Noah and the ark and the flood. Then you have Moses and the Ten Commandments and the golden calf that they made. And then Isaiah with the prophecy. It all comes together. The Old Testament points us to the cross. The New Testament points us back to what, what Christ did for us. But it's all one message. Back over on that corner, you have oh, the, narrative, the narrative of the birth of Christ and then him teaching in the, the temple as a child and then the baptism, the miracle at the wedding in John, healing of the sick and the lame, his walking on the water, plus then the, the image of the crucifixion, the resurrection from the empty tomb, and then the ascension. Um, you gotta be very careful with this because one of the things we emphasize within the Reformed teaching, uh, Reformed faith, is that we're not to have images. 
nor to worship images. The PCA is very particular about that, but this really, was here before. Really, no images of Jesus. Well, we prefer not to have images of Jesus because we don't want to fall into the practice of idolatry. And when we think of who Christ is, we don't want the stained glass to become our image of Christ. Well, who's we that guy then? Because <laughs> that, that looks a ton like Jesus. Well, we Nazareth. don't know what Jesus would have looked like, but I, we need to make it very clear that this is a representation of what the scriptures teach about Jesus, but that's not who Jesus is. There was one more stained glass window that caught my eye as we were walking in. Right. Yeah. Before we get up to all the stuff up front, can I ask you about this one? Yeah. You know which one I'm talking about, yeah. right? It's around the corner here. And it's one of my favorites just because of the history that's in it. This Celtic cross here was the logo for the United Presbyterian Church in the United States. And by Celtic cross, you mean this? Right, th yes. This, that cross there with the, the circles in the middle. And then there's this great s symbolism that's tied into it where you have uh, the burning bush from the story of, of Moses uh, that was burning but not consumed. You have the Holy Spirit coming down at the baptism of Christ. You have this, awesome cross from the, the ancient church where you have uh, the uh, Jesus Christ victorious uh, written out here. So IC would be the, the Latin abbreviation for Jesus, uh, the XC being the Latin abbreviation or Greek abbreviation for Christ, and then Nika, everybody wears Nike, they know what Nike is. Nike was the, the Greek god of victory, but Nika means victorious. And so this, this cross is, Christ is victorious over the earth, over all the, the world. So this you have, bears a lot of the same marks as the division that I saw on the, the host, the bread yes, from the Orthodox yeah, Church yeah. that they distribute. I mean, this is, this is the ancient Eucharist. symbolism. Uh, so it's not Presbyterian by any means, but they just incorporate into their symbol. And then you have this here, which the the Alpha and the Omega um, uh, symbolized uh, in the open word, um, which reveals Christ. Thank you for indulging that yeah, detour. Can absolutely. we work our way back to the front sure. now? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. The Lord's table and the baptismal font, which is behind you here, and the, the pulpit are all sort of up front and present uh, during worship, because even when we don't celebrate the Lord's Supper. Uh, we, we have this idea that we're coming around the presence of God, uh, the presence of Christ, um, which is symbolized. Not actually, he's not actually put on an altar and, and, and sacrificed here, but it's symbolized by coming at the table where Jesus has prepared a meal for us. The font is there to remind us that we come under his word to be washed, to be cleansed by the anointing of his spirit. And it all happens through the, the preaching and the teaching of God's word. Word and sacrament go together. It should be just front and center at every worship service. Do people become a Christian there? Or do people become a Christian here? Or do people become a Christian somewhere else? We are saved because God, from the beginning of time, knew those whom he would call into himself. And as Ephesians 1 tells us, before the foundation of the earth, he blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And like we read about in Deuteronomy, uh, how it wasn't because of anything that we had done uh, or that Israel had done, but God set his affection upon his people and, and saved them and delivered them, not because they were strong and mighty or better than all the other people. Picked Abraham for no reason. For no reason, other than, other than it was for God's good pleasure. And so God from the beginning of time has redeemed those whom he would call his own. In, in, the, in the course of time, sent his son to die upon the cross for the, uh, for the atoning of his people, to take away the wrath against those sins, and to give them life and righteousness uh, by, by faith in Jesus. And so that's all something that God has done for us. Uh, then he pours out his spirit upon his elect, who then come alive, repent, believe, and trust in him, and then grow in righteousness. So where are we in that process when we come to the fount? <laughs> it's, it's long after everything that God has done. We come recognizing, like when we baptize an individual, we come recognizing God has saved you in Jesus Christ. To an adult who's being baptized, they're, they're saying, I make a proclamation of faith that I have been saved by God's grace in Jesus Christ, that I'm a sinner who needs washed of my sins, and I find that washing in the blood of Jesus. Um, when, we, when parents bring their children forward for baptism, we believe, as, as Paul says in Corinthians, that the children of believers are righteous, that they've been set apart by God because they are part of this covenant community. Like God had covenant people in the Old Testament, he has covenant people in the New Testament. 
And that covenant is with God, or God, between God and his people and their children. Peter said it in the Pentecost sermon. Uh, believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And this is God's promise for you and for your children. So that child doesn't become They're not. a Christian when the water hits them. Right. They are, they are baptized members of the church, but they're not, uh, they're not what we would call a communing member of the church. They haven't made a public profession of faith. And that's so, how you become a communing member? You, to become you, a communing member then, uh, you know, it's, it's first of all that recognition that you are a sinner, dependent upon God's grace in Jesus Christ. Um, in order to become a covenant or a communing member of a particular congregation then, you would meet with the elders of that church. Um, you would give a testimony to your faith you know, your, your understanding of your sin and God's work for your salvation and your intention to be, you know, a part of this body. And then you stand before the congregation, make that public profession of faith, and then you're, you are a communing member received uh, at the table. Can I ask you a couple more questions about Absolutely. the room? And then could we just sit down for a Absolutely. while and talk yeah. shop? Yeah. Okay. I see this mosaic uh -huh. up here. This was a gift from one of the previous ministers of the church. Um, shortly after this church was, the sanctuary was uh, designed. And oh, so you can never take it down. No, no, no. <laughs> Part of what I really like about this is that the whole gospel thing, it's four yeah. books, it's a lot of material. Yeah. It can become a brain full. Uh -huh. I can just feel like Jesus went around and he was nice and he said tons of interesting <laughs> things and people this liked him and it was compelling. This really nails it down. Yeah. That, He's the fulfillment of what came before. The, the incarnation. The Trinity, uh -huh. his provision, uh -huh. that he's the provider in the kingdom, how the kingdom is established, that it is an on, it's and, just. And, and there's, even, there's even subtle things here. Like you have, you have the, uh, the 12 disciples represented by the wafers and then oh, the hey. one uh, from, from uh, Judas who betrayed him. <laughs> he that's, gets the lousy one. Little, it's, 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 uh, it's not gold, it's sort of silverish. It's, it's set Shek apart. Shekelish. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, how about that? Yeah. Oh my goodness, is there a pipe organ behind here? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yeah, I no, can it's just. It's from that age where you had to have an organ to fill the sanctuary. So why wouldn't you, I mean, if you oh. had the option. Well, and, okay, so over time, the sanctuary here has changed too. It used to be that the pulpit um, might've been off to one side and you had a banister here where the, where the choir sat. Okay. And the organ was up here somewhere as well. And then over time they've moved it Oh, it's they've, down here. They've taken that. all of the railings down and now the pulpit is right what here. What did the there. railings do? Was this like a... a sort of fencing off the, uh, uh, the, the choir loft. Oh, the, yeah. okay. So this, There's, this there at no here. point, I mean, I can see the, yeah. the carpet line. Yeah. This at no point here was some kind of holy of holies no or... No chancellery or anything There was like no that, right. iconostasis right. here no. to separate... There was a railing that this was where the choir sat. And okay. Yeah. So... And there's no theological significance in Presbyterianism to the choir other than you'd want them to point their singing at the room. Uh, I want them to point their singing upward. <laughs> I look around the room. Mm -hmm. I got cross. Everywhere. Cross. Uh -huh. uh, cross up here, here, yeah. here. Cross on the side of every uh, pew. Oh, so you do. Yeah. And then obviously the gigantic one up here. Right. And then even outside on the, behind oh, the stained glass. Okay, just a minute. I got to work that over a little bit to see it. Yep. Yeah. What I notice is that unlike a lot of other churches I go to, there's no Jesus on these crosses. Right. They're not, I guess, what you call crucifixes. Right. They're just crosses. Is there a theological significance or is it just in keeping with that reformed notion of simplicity? It wasn't simply his death upon the cross, the crucifixion, that, was, uh, that brought about salvation or it was atoning. It was his death and his resurrection. And so we don't have an image of Christ, for one thing. Uh, we don't have him still upon the cross because that's not the end of the story. And that's not to say that those who have a crucifix believe that's the end of the story, but that's not where the atonement was brought about to completion. It was his dying and rising again. Uh, Paul says in Romans that he, he was crucified for our sins and he was raised for our justification. And so the, the two go hand in hand. So in, in most Protestant Reformed traditions, you will have an empty cross uh, reminding us that this is where the atoning work was was completed, or this is where the atoning work was done, but the story was completed in his resurrection and ascension. So the cross is a reminder that that's where the, the guilt was paid for, um, but he's not there. Hmm. Yeah, he's been raised. My job is simply to proclaim the truth of what God has done already for us, that God has done this for us in Jesus Christ. This is, 
Uh, I think I heard Sinclair Ferguson once say that the, the primary role of the pastor is to remind people of who they are because Satan's job, Satan's greatest joy is to steal our identity, to make us forget what God has done for us. And so my job as a pastor is to remind you of the gospel and what God has done for you in Jesus Christ and of what that, what ramifications that has in, in every aspect of life. Well, let me ask more specifically. Your job is to remind us of who we are. Mm -hmm. Who are we? We are those who have been called by and redeemed by God in His grace through Jesus Christ. I think that's a beautiful place to end a church tour. Thank you for showing me around. Every time we do one of these videos, I've got some moment where I'm like, hey, let's take a second here and tip our hats to the person who was willing to go on camera, to the church that was willing to open their doors to us. And I'm not joking around about that. I really do think we need to take a second to appreciate what a big risk and what a big deal it is for a group to be willing to do that and to give us the benefit of the doubt and assume that I'm there representing you who are there because we really actually want to know. Thank you very, very much to Pastor Ethan, to Lennox Ebenezer Presbyterian Church. That's a cool thing for you to do. And part of the reason that I think it's a cool thing for these churches to do this is because, well, I guess I just alluded to it a second ago, there is risk involved. See, for you and me, coming from the outside and looking at any institution, in this case, let's say a church, we see a list of beliefs. We see a building where those beliefs play out. We see the personality of at least one person who's internalized those beliefs and then runs with it and tries to figure out how to articulate that and live it out. What we don't see when we visit these churches are all of the pressures that the individuals and the institutions feel. They've all got a story. They've all got a personality. They've all got pressures that they feel. And it's interesting for me to map this out and try to share it with you as I'm slowly developing this map. It's interesting for me to figure out who feels what pressures, what stories from the past, what things going on now are working on which groups of, of different expressions of historical Christianity that we interact with right now. And I'll tell you what, there have been two churches I've visited that are not Catholic, not Orthodox, where I sense that the historical pressure, the historical impulse of the Reformation is still really informing where they're at. One was the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. The other is this Reformed Presbyterian Church. It is so much more evident here than, say, in visiting an Assemblies of God church that the, the tension, the 2,000 years of church history shapes not just the stuff that the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church does and that the Presbyterian Church does, but it shapes what they don't do. And those churches that are startup-ish, they're just getting going right now, the big non-denominational dazzled jeans pastor kind of church, the more recent holiness movement kind of churches, there's a certain lightness that goes with that. Like, ah, oh, we read the Bible and it looks like the gospel is in here and we should tell people that because we're excited about that thing. There's not the historical baggage. It's easier for those newer groups to be like, yeah, it's not really our fight. I, I don't know. I, I don't have to sort that one out. I don't know. But some of these other groups, they're positioned in a place where, no, we are a part of this very big historical thing. And here's sort of our chapter, our bit in the conversation. And I sense that from Presbyterianism. But I also sense that in addition to those pressures, there's also some commonality that has maybe been forgotten a little bit over time. So I walked into the building. You just walked in there with me. It's beautiful, magnificent building. And the very first thing that I notice as I walk in is, oh, this has got that upside down hull of a boat build like you see in some Catholic churches and some Eastern churches. Like, look, it looks like a boat. And those look like the timbers that support the frame of the hull of the boat. And it's like, this is an upside down ark. And it's like a reminder of the deal that God made with Noah, where he's like, all right, we're going to have a flood. These lethal floodwaters are going to cover everything, but I'm going to 
to put you in this safe vessel that was my idea and by my provision, and I'm going to guide you through these otherwise absolutely perilous lethal waters. And in the same way, there's this new family of faith and this new family of faith is called together and made out of nothing by Jesus and the church is the vessel, it's the the body, y'all are in here in this preservative device, and the church building is meant to remind you of that, and the timbers and the lines are meant to draw your eyes heavenward. Who am I quoting there? Who am I channeling with those words? Because if you're Catholic, you're probably sitting there going, yes, dang straight, that's us. If you're Orthodox, you're like, yeah, I mean, we like the round roof a little better, but yeah, that's us. I mean, that's why we call it the nave. And it's nave navigation. Like, yeah, for sure. We see it. It's why the anchor is this historical symbol. It all connects. But you know what? If you're some kind of Protestant, you're probably doing the same thing. If you go to a church that looks anything like the one we just visited, you're going, yeah, that's us. We want the lines to draw our attention upward. And yes, this is a reminder that God, that Christ is head of the church and that our life and our hope and our salvation and our existence is only by the grace of Christ, who for his own glory and his own purposes preserves us. What's dynamic and fascinating to me is that all of these groups would agree that that symbolism is and should be present. But did you catch how careful Ethan was to clarify that, hey, we still feel a historical pressure here that we don't want all the accoutrements and the fancy stuff. We don't think that the gold and the gold inlay and all of the imagery and all of the other things best accomplishes that sense of here's who we are in relationship to God and this is what draws our worship up to God. Now, a Catholic would say, well, we also think our eyes should be drawn upward to the heavens and we also think that Christ is the head of the church it's just that we think all the accoutrements do point to that. Like, why wouldn't you bring your best stuff? Why wouldn't you dress in your finest robes to go and meet the king? Why wouldn't you want to interact with all the other people who though they now may be physically dead or still, in a sense, in this metaphorical boat? And why wouldn't you want your fanciest, nicest, grandest stuff to be in this building? Of all the buildings in town, why wouldn't you throw the most resources at the one that is an offering back to God? And the Protestants, the reformers here, wanting the exact same thing, say, I don't know, in our cultural context, we see it the exact opposite. Why would you not make yourself like a little child to humbly come before the king in a position, a posture of modesty that Jesus affirms again and again? I'm open to it right here in Matthew 18, Matthew 19, Matthew 20, whoever wants to be first, you know, you got to be last if you want to do that. The the meek shall inherit the earth. It's an upside down kingdom. So we shouldn't think of it the way we think of a normal kingdom where you come big and you come fancy before that king to impress him. There's nothing you can do to impress this king. Salvation is entirely by the grace of this king. And so we should come small. We should come humble. And that's why we're not going to dress up with the fancy robes and outfits. And it's why our communion table is going to be modest. And it's why we're not going to have a ton of images. It's why Ethan was even uncomfortable being like, okay, the stained glass, like it points to Bible stuff, but this predates the, this particular expression of this denomination of Presbyterianism. Like I didn't put this in here. And so he both thought it was neat, but also wanted to caution like this tiptoes right up to the edge of our convictions about what church should feel like. And so We've got a ton more to unpack about Presbyterianism. We're going to get into Presbyterian Reformed theology a whole bunch in the next couple of videos, sitting down and talking with Pastor Ethan. But just strictly from a tour point of view, I came away kind of encouraged, feeling like, man, this sounds a lot like what other Christians from other traditions I know are going for with their building. Maybe we just disagree a little bit about how to best achieve that. And maybe, how long am I in here? I got a little more time. Maybe it's a bit cultural too. Maybe that Germanic, Swiss, Central European mindset in the 16th century was a bit more practical and a bit more button up. They'd never had the wealth or the resources of old imperial Rome at their disposal. And so maybe the natural building material in Germany was going to be timber, stuff that looks a bit more practical and woodsy. I've spent a ton of time in Italy and in Rome and you look around and there are these open 
marble pit mines everywhere. This stuff was wildly abundant. There's a reason that they built with it. It was a natural building material for the area. It also just happens to communicate wealth and prestige and grandeur. So maybe you just have a cultural difference. And as Christianity expands throughout Europe in the first millennium, maybe what resonates in Rome just doesn't resonate in Germany. And maybe over a given period of time, people who are Swiss-ish and German-ish are just like, this has never felt like, it's never translated in terms of what it feels like to interact rightly with God. And so, yeah, we just skew this way. I don't want to minimize the theological convictions of the reformers. I just want to acknowledge that maybe that little element is at least worth, sorry, considering because Christianity has moved so far out from its original historical cultural context. Different cultures, different worlds, stuff means stuff everywhere. But it's fun when you go and look at it and you realize that, man, it really does seem like the motivation for Joe and Linda, I'm sitting in the pews here worshiping, whether Catholic or otherwise, it looks like the motivations are pretty similar in terms of what we're going for in terms of accoutrements and design and the glory of God, but maybe some disagreement about what culturally best communicates that glory of God. I've gone on too long on that particular point. I thought it interesting that the video opened with me saying, all right, what's an Ebenezer? And that that's not play acting. I, it just honestly, I don't know, maybe probably somebody told me that once. I just didn't remember. So I asked and he told me, oh, this is the pile of rocks and the pile of rocks is a reminder of what God has done. And immediately I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that stuff. Okay, got it. That's an Ebenezer. Cool. Well, then we go through the whole thing. And you saw what Ethan got most excited about throughout all of it. When we were actually talking about the gospel and the grace of God and how God reaches down into this broken world and redeems instead of just wiping the whole thing clean. And he really wanted to pound that point. And anything in the room that pointed to that He wanted to hit that and he wanted to hit it with energy and enthusiasm. So you got the reminder stone. You got all of this excitement about the most basic thing uh, about who God is and what he's done. And then we get to the end. And I don't think I left my question in, but I asked him, uh, what's the point of your church? What is your job as a pastor? And his answer was to remind. I remind people of this glorious, transcendent, important thing that God has done. The video opens then with Ethan saying the name of our church includes this notion of remembering who God is and what he's done. Then the whole video, the stuff he wants to tell me is here's how all these different things in our building point to who God is and what he's done. And then at the very end, I ask him, what's the point? What do you do? Well, I remind people of who God is and what he's done. So the the hint I'm taking here is that who God is and what he's done is very, very important to this group and specifically reminding people of that is very important. As a result, this did not have the outward kinetic momentum that I've seen from some other non-Catholic, non-Orthodox groups, but rather I sensed that they view their job as being that flag in the ground, that reminder group that guards the boundaries of historical Protestant Orthodoxy and is there with clarity on that to serve as this reminder set of stones to anyone who might need to be reminded of those things. There's a lot more to this theological tradition, and we're going to unpack that together over the next couple of videos. Thank you for hanging out with me. Thank you as always for your grace, for your charitability, for your curiosity, but thank you also for your own conviction. This exercise doesn't work unless we give each other permission to think the things we think and read the information and the data and the Bible the way we read it, if we come at each other demanding that I need you to just not think what you deeply convictionally think anymore, how can we coexist? How can we be friends? How can we push towards some common goal together? I appreciate your mindset and your orientation toward convictional unity from wherever you're coming from in a position of belief, giving each other the benefit of the doubt in the sincerity of those convictions in agreement and in disagreement. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.